This lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about Gorenstein rings. Or more precisely, it will be about Gorenstein local rings because all rings are going to be local and notarian. Um, so Gorenstein rings are rings with a sort of duality property. Um, so um, um, in order to define them, let's first do the zero dimensional case, which is a little bit easier than the than the general case. So, so um, if R is zero dimensional and notarian and local, then R is Gorenstein um, turns out to be equivalent to saying that HOM over R from K to R is um, one dimensional over the field K as a vector space. So here, here this dimension is the dimension over the vector space K and here the dimension is the dimension, the ring theoretic definition. Um, K is going to be the field R over M where M is the maximal ideal. And um, more generally we can define the dual of a module M to be HOM um, over R from M to R. Um, and um, if R is Gorenstein, uh, this implies that the dual of M behaves well. For instance, the dual of M, the dual of the dual of M should be the should be isomorphic to M if M is a finitely generated module over R and so on. For general rings, um, this definition of duality doesn't behave at all well. And in, in fact, um, for general zero dimensional rings, there's an alternative definition of duality where you define that the, the dual of M to be HOM over um, R from M to omega. So this is going to be the dual of M, where omega is some special module called the dualizing module. So for Gorenstein rings, they're the ones where the dualizing module happens to be isomorphic to the ring you first thought of, at least in the naught dimensional case. High dimensions, things get, get more complicated. So let's see a few examples of zero dimensional rings that are or aren't Gorenstein. So first of all, we could take, say, a ring of formal power series modulo x to the five. And here, hom over R from K to R, um, just as dimension equals one because it's spanned by, say, it's spanned by X to the four. And it's sort of useful to kind of draw a picture of these, of, of zero dimensional rings as a lot of blocks. So for instance, this ring can be pictured as a series of five blocks where, where this bottom block is generated by um, x to the four. Um, the two bottom blocks are generated by x cubed, by x squared, x and one. So each of these blocks sort of represents a subquotient isomorphic to k. So, so this, this ring has length five as a module over itself and you can picture pictures looking like this. And then the reason it's Gorenstein is that there's only one block on the bottom. So hom from k to r is sort of the blocks on the bottom of this tower and uh, hopefully the um, pictures of these towers will become a little bit clearer in, in the next example. So now let's look at r equals k x y and I'm going to quotient out by x squared x y and y squared. And now let's draw a picture of this ring as a module over itself and this time it is length three so we get three blocks and we can sort of picture the blocks a bit like this. So this is going to be generated, that the whole tower is generated by one and this block might be generated by x and this might be generated by y say. And now you notice that um, there are two, I've drawn two blocks on the bottom. This corresponds to the fact that hom over r from k to r um, this time has dimension equal to two because it's a two dimensional space spanned by X and Y. So this one is not Gorenstein. 
Um, we can sort of make it Gorenstein by quotienting out a bit less. So, so now if I take r equals kxy modulo x squared and y squared, now this is length 4, um, and I can draw a picture of it a bit like this. So on top I have the 1, and then I have the submodules generated by x and y, which are all two-dimensional because they, they both contain x, y. And now that, that you can see the, that there's only one block on the bottom, so this corresponds to the fact that um, the dimension from hom over r from k to r is now equal to 1 again. So this, this one is Gorenstein. And another informal way of thinking of a Gorenstein ring that's zero-dimensional is it looks the same if you turn it upside down. So if I take five blocks here and flip them upside down, I get the same thing. And that corresponds to the fact that R is kind of self-dual in some sense. If I take this collection and flip it upside down, then it looks like that, which is definitely different. Now there's only one thing on the bottom. And that sort of corresponds to the fact that R is not self-dual. If, if you dualize R, you get a different module. And finally, this one is the same upside down again, so it is indeed self-dual. Um, so for zero dimensions, the duality property of R is reasonably easy to understand. Um, in higher dimensions, the definition um, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, Grothendieck defined Gorenstein rings. Um, so, as usual, these are going to be local notarian rings. So, suppose R has dimension R. It's called Gorenstein if um, x to the i of kr is 0 for i not equal to d and has dimension 1 for i equals d. So for i equals 0, so for d equals 0, which is just the zero dimensional case, x to 0 is just hom, so this is sort of saying hom from k to r is one dimensional, which is what we had before. Um, now the first thing you notice about this definition is, is that it's really a bit of a heavyweight definition. Um, it's not immediately obvious what this, what these higher order exts are. Um, you can also wonder why they're called Gorenstein. Um, I can't spell Gorenstein. Why is it called a Gorenstein ring if the definition was invented by Grothendieck? Well, um, Gorenstein um, was uh, best known as the group theorist who was sort of uh, directed the classification of finite simple groups. But before he started doing group theory, he actually worked in algebraic geometry. And he proved a theorem about um, plane curve singularities. And he found a certain property of them, which turns out to be equivalent to the Gorenstein property. So Grothendieck named them after Gorenstein because Gorenstein essentially showed that plane curve singularities are Gorenstein rings. Um, incidentally, mathematical folklore says that Gorenstein himself went around claiming that he didn't actually understand the definition of a Gorenstein ring. Um, I'm not buying this. I mean, Gorenstein was a smart guy and was perfectly capable of understanding this definition. And for heaven's sake, if someone names something after you, of course you go and read up what the definition is. So it's a nice story, but um, you should take it with a grain of salt. Um, there's a uh, I think the, the, the name Gorenstein ring was really popularised by Bass, who, who wrote this famous paper on ubiquity of Gorenstein rings shortly after um, Gorenstein invented them. Um, OK, so uh, obviously Bass had a word day calendar or something, and he came up with this word ubiquity, um, which means everywhere present. and it, yeah, it's, it's, it's used a lot by theologians, and I discovered this when I was trying to search on Google for, ubiqui for the paper Ubiquity of Gorenstein Rings. And when you get as far as Ubiquity of G.O., Google suddenly throws up a lot of search suggestions about papers on the Ubiquity of God. So, um, anyway. Um, 
Um, unfortunately, Bass's paper is behind a paywall if you try and search for it, but if you have a university account, you may be able to get hold of a copy. Um, so anyway, let's get back to this problem that this definition is rather rather heavy going. Fortunately, in order to test whether a ring is Gorenstein, we can use a much simpler criterion. Um, if R is greater, uh, if, if R has dimension greater than zero, then R is Gorenstein if and only if R has um, a zero divisor so a non-zero divisor um, x in M so that R over um, x is Gorenstein. So you remember exactly the same thing held for cohen macaulay rings. A ring is cohen macaulay if and only if when you quotient it out by a non-zero divisor the result is, is also cohen macaulay So you can sort of reduce your ring to a zero-dimensional ring um, like this, um, and then test the zero dimensional ring to see if it's Gorenstein. And if you can't get down to zero dimensions, then your ring isn't even Cohn Macaulay and it's not Gorenstein. And you may sort of worry a bit that um, you have to choose this non zero divisor um, carefully, but in fact, it doesn't matter. So, so any non zero divisor will do, provided it's in M. Um, I'm not going to prove this, but it's quite easy to prove. What you do is, if x is a non-zero divisor, we look at um, the exact sequence. Naught goes to r goes to r goes to r over x. And then we've got a short exact sequence. So you remember from homological algebra, you can get lots and lots of long exact sequences involving the x groups from that. And by playing around with those, you can show that this condition here is equivalent to this condition about x groups. Um, you may wonder why we don't use this simpler definition. Um, well, the answer is with the simpler definition, it's not at all clear that the result is independent of the choice of x, which is a bit of a nuisance. Um, this more high-powered definition using x groups, it's um, theoretically a bit easier to use because you, you, you don't have to choose an element and check it's independent of the choice of element. Um, so what we're going to do now is just give some examples of higher dimensional rings that are or aren't Gorenstein. It turns out that being Gorenstein is actually a really subtle property and making a apparently harmless change to the ring um, changes whether or not it's Gorenstein. So the first example is we're going to take the ring of power series in two variables and we're going to let this be acted on by a group of um, order three, a cyclic group of order three, and we're going to look at the fixed subring and see whether this is Gorenstein. Well, um, there's more than one way this group of order three can act on this. It can change, for instance, it can change x to omega x, where omega um, is a cube root of unity. So omega cubed equals one. We're going to work over a field of um, characteristic not three. So let's just say the characteristic of k is not equal to three. Um, and we could map y to omega y and that would give us one ring. Alternatively, we could map x to omega x, and we could map y to omega squared y. And this looks like a completely trivial um, change. There doesn't really seem to be much difference between these two actions, but we'll see that one of them is Gorenstein and one of them isn't. So um, in order to see whether they're Gorenstein or not, we should start by drawing a picture of the ring. And we're going to sort of start by drawing, well, it's not quite a basis, but let's pretend it's a basis. So we draw one x, x squared, x cubed, y, y squared, y cubed, and, and so on. So, so we draw a point for each monomial, and um, this isn't quite a basis because it's formal power series, so whatever, but... Um, we won't worry about that too much. Now, what we have to do um, is, is identify 
the, 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 the fixed elements. So, so the elements that are fixed under x goes to omega x and y goes to omega y are going to be those um, such that the total degree is, is divisible by 3. So our, our, our ring will really be um, sort of all these orange things here. And now this is a two-dimensional ring, so um, what we have to do is quotient out by a non-zero divisor. So let's pick a non-zero divisor. So, so x cubed is a good non-zero divisor. And let's quotient out by x cubed. Well, that means we throw out everything um, in this region here. And this reduces us to a one-dimensional ring. And now we can ask, is this one-dimensional ring um, Gorenstein? Well, to do that, um, we again have to quotient out by a non-zero divisor. And a non-zero divisor in this quotient is y cubed. So here's a non-zero divisor. And let's quotient out by this non-zero divisor. Well, that means we throw away everything here. And what are we left with? Well, now we're left with a zero-dimensional ring looking like this. And now you see, if we draw um, it in block form, it kind of looks like this. Um, it, here, here, this element would be x, y squared, and this element here would be um, x squared, y. So the, um, we see that hom... Uh, um, over r from k to r, where r is now this bit here, has, has, it, it, it's now two-dimensional, so this is not Gorenstein. Now let's do the same with this ring here, and I'll do this a bit much more quickly because it's very similar. So again we draw out the um, uh, sort of not quite a basis for it, looking like this. And this time we mark in orange the fixed point elements, and this time it looks a little bit different. Now it looks like this. Um, so the fixed point elements are going to be lines looking like that. And now again we kill off a non zero divisor like this. So we kill off all this stuff, and then we take a second non zero divisor here and kill off all the stuff that's a multiple of it. And now we see we're left with something that, that, that's subtly different. Um, if we draw this in block form, it now looks like this. So this is 1 xy x squared y squared. So now the dimension of hom over r from k to r is just 1. Um, in fact, it's spanned by this bit here, whereas in the previous example it was spanned by these two bits here. So although these two rings look almost identical, one of them is Gorenstein and one of them isn't. Um, this is also illustrates the fact it's actually quite hard to tell whether a ring is Gorenstein just by sort of looking at it. Um, you know, if a ring is regular or Cohen-Macaulay, it's usually pretty obvious whether or not it's regular or Cohen-Macaulay. I mean, regular sort of means non-singular looks like a manifold, and cohen macaulay has something to do with bits of different dimension not meeting, but, but Gorenstein property is much subtler. Um, so now I'm going to give another example where it's really quite hard to guess whether a ring is Gorenstein or not. This time I'm going to look at singularities of curves in um, four-dimensional affine space. Um, and I'm writing down curves by writing down equations in four-dimensional affine space is a bit tedious because you've got to write down lots of equations. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to define the curve by the image under an embedding. So what I can do, I can map the curve A1 to A4 by mapping the point T to say T to the 4, T to the 5, T to the 6, T to the 7. And then the image of this will have some sort of funny cusp at 
at, at the origin. Or another thing I can do is I can map it to t to the 5, t to the 6, t to the 7, t to the 8. Or I could map it to t to the 6, t to the 7, t to the 8, t to the 9. And I think you have to agree that these um, three curves all look very, you know, look very similar. I mean, if I, if, I, if I asked you to guess which of them were Gorenstein and which were not Gorenstein, you would probably have rather a hard job trying to see any difference at all between them. And if, if you draw pictures of them in four-dimensional space, they, it's very hard to distinguish them. And what we're going to do is, to, is we're going to show the middle one is Gorenstein, but the two outer ones are not Gorenstein. So I think this again illustrates that the Gorenstein property is very subtle. So let's first look at the first one. And for this, again, I'm going to draw a basis of the ring. So we're going to draw um, 1 t, t squared, t cubed, t to the 4, t to the 5, and so on. I forgot to say, we're look at, looking at the local ring at the origin, of course, um, at all points other than the origin, the, 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 this is just a regular curve, so it's not very interesting. And now, um, the local ring at the origin, or let's say the completion of the local ring at the origin, doesn't actually contain t or t squared or t cubed. It just contains 1, t to the 4, t to the 5, t to the 6, t to the 7. And then it contains t to the 8, because that's t to the 4 squared. And it contains everything beyond that. So the, the local ring... Well, let, let's take its completion for simplicity. Then it's going to be sort of spanned by the, well, in some formal sense, by, by these elements here. So now let's work out whether it's Gartenstein. <coughs> so we pick a non-zero divisor in the maximal ideal, which will be this element here. And we then have to um, kill off all elements in the ideal generated by this. So we have to multiply this by 1, and then we have to multiply it by t to the 4, and t to the 5, and t to the 6, and so on. So um, if we look at r over t to the 4, we need to check whether this is Gorenstein, and it just consists of this element, and this, and this, and this, and you see the product of any of these two is zero. So we see that um, hom over um, uh, whatever it is, uh, r over t to the 4, I guess, from um, k to r over t to the 4 has dimension 3. So it's not Gorenstein. Um, well, now let's do this case, where we take t to the 5, t to the 6, t to the 7, t to the 8, and see um, th th this apparently trivial change from 4 to 5 does actually make a difference. So again, we draw a picture of a basis for the local ring. So we can take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this is going to be 5, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so on. So our ring, the local ring, contains 1. It contains t to the 5, 6, 7, and 8. It doesn't contain t to the 9. It contains t to the 10, t to the 11, t to the 12, and so on. So it contains everything beyond that. Um, I can't quite remember how far I need to go. So, so we want to test whether this ring, this orange ring, is Gorenstein. And to do that, we pick a non-zero divisor. So here's a non-zero divisor, t to the 5. And now we need to work out the ideal generated by t to the 5. So we need t to the 5, and then it contains t to the 10, t to the 11, t to the 12, t to the 13. It doesn't contain t to the 14, though, but it does contain t to the 15 and everything beyond that. So let's summarize what we've got. Um, so this is t to the 14. So, so let's look at what r over t to the 5 looks like. Well, it contains t to the 1. It contains 
t to the 6, t to the 7, t to the 8, and it also contains t to the 14. Um, and now we want to work out what is hom over r over t to the 5 from k to r over t to the 5. Well, we notice that none of these elements are, can be in the image of k because t to the 6 times t to the 8 equals t to the 14, which is not 0, and t to the 7 times t to the 7 equals t to the 14, which is not 0. So um, this space here is one dimensional spanned by t to the 14, so the dimension of this is equal to 1. So it is Gorenstein. Um, you notice we are getting a sort of duality on this three-dimensional space. Um, we, we get a sort of bilinear form mapping this three-dimensional space times itself to this one-dimensional space. And this is, this is part of the duality that you always um, expect when working with Gorenstein rings. Um, so the third example, now let's look at um, what happens if you take 6, 7, 8 and 9. So here we've got um, 1, so our ring contains the elements 1, and then it contains 1, 2, 3, sorry, t to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and contains t to the 6, 7, 8, and 9. Um, let me write these down, I'm losing track, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then it doesn't contain 10, 11, but it contains t to the 12, um, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and so on. Actually, I have to go a bit further. And uh, let me write 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and so on. And now, as usual, we have to <coughs> question up by a zero divisor, which we choose to be t to the 6. And this kills off t to the 6, and then we kill off that. And th then we have to kill off t to the 12, t to the 13, 14, 15, but we keep 16, 17, and then we kill off t to the 18, and we kill off everything beyond that. So if we look at r over t to the 6, we end up with 1, t to the 7, t to the 8, t to the 9, t to the 16, t to the 17. And um, the home from k to this is now two-dimensional, spanned by these two elements here. So again, this example is not Gorenstein. So you see, being Gorenstein is a sort of very subtle arithmetic property of exactly which elements we have, um, which of these elements appear in a basis for the ring. Um, so I'll just finish by sketching the fact that um, regular rings are Gorenstein. Um, and for this we use the causal complex. Um, so you remember if we've got a um, um, if we've got a regular local ring R um, this time we're going to use growth index, rather high-powered um, definition of um, regular rings. Of course, you could do it just by using the, just by quotienting it out by a regular sequence and getting down to a one-dimensional, um, to a zero-dimensional ring that's one-dimensional over k, so that would prove it. But I, I want to do it using the causal complex. So we want to show that x to the d over r of k and r has length 1. And we want to show that all the ones other than this vanish. So what we do is we pick x1 up to xd to be a basis for m over m squared, which we can do as r is regular. And then we look at the causal complex. 
So we get naught goes to R, goes to R to the D, goes to R to the D, choose 2, and so on. So it goes all the way down to R to the D, goes to R, goes to R over x1 up to x to the D, which is in fact isomorphic to K. Um, and now we can use this to compute the x groups. So we want to compute x um, to the d over r of k and r. And you remember for this, um, we can um, 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 we've got um, we we see that this x group is given by the homology of the sequence naught goes to r goes to r to the d and so on. So we want the homology at this point here. And if we remember what the causal complex is, um, this dual map will take um, 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 a, a basis um, a1 up to ad to x1 a1 plus x2 a2 and so on. So the, 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 the homology of this bit here will be r over x1 x2 up to xd which is equal to k. So um, so we can show using the causal complex that this piece here has dimension 1. Um, and in fact, if this group here has dimension 1, then it in fact implies all the other x groups have dimension 0. So in fact, you don't really need to calculate them. Um, OK, next lecture, uh, next two lectures, we're going to be studying the other sort of ring, which is complete intersection rings and what we're first going to be doing is studying fitting ideals which are a useful technical tool for studying complete intersection rings.